Okay, we got about 40 seconds to go, but thanks for coming on History X with me this morning. I jumped on a few seconds early because I wanted to show this uh, to you guys. So here in Minneapolis, there is just a ridiculous thunderstorm going on right now. And <laughs> so I just... I've already lost power once. That was about a half hour ago and I had to, you know, get everything going again. So if this shuts off or for some reason a uh, disconnection happens because of this thunderstorm that is just ridiculous. You can see St. Paul is right there. I'm actually west of St. Paul in Minneapolis. So, hey Michael. Well, all right. I guess the power hasn't knocked you out. Um but as I said, if if things get shot, if things get shut down, I'm going to continue to record like, oh, geez, there's Ron and Janice. Great. Um, good to see par for the courses here. Okay, so here's the deal. Like I said, the thunderstorm is ridiculous. If it gets knocked out, I'll just keep recording and post this later, which is actually what I'm going to do anyway, because there's going to be some video that I want to add to this that I'm not going to be able to play during the live session. But I'm just going to... Um, you know, march forward and not let this storm get in the way. Two things I want to cover this morning. Going to uh, do about a half hour. Two things I want to cover. Obviously, I put this on because I want to talk about the Kieber, the B-29 bomber that was uh, ditched in northern Greenland just after World War II. And then there was a attempted cover in the mid-1990s. That is what I have been spending <laughs> a lot of time working on. So for those of you that are used to me posting weekly, maybe twice a week, you've probably noticed that maybe there's been a post once a week, maybe every other week. And that's because I've been doing a lot of research about the keybird. In addition to the keybird, of course, is, and I'm going to switch screens here. is this why can't i pull this up there we go okay so everyone's talking about the uss the sullivans taking on water in buffalo and last week saturday i did a live segment with shane stevenson the curator at the buffalo naval park he gave us a lot of information about what's going on behind the scenes, what his days are like. I'm not actually going to give you an update on the Sullivans. You guys are bright enough. You can get online and see what the latest is. However, there are a couple of things that I did want to point out that either aren't getting attention or if they are getting attention, people aren't talking about them. Everybody knows that divers are going in the water, okay? They're putting divers in the water to check out the integrity of the hull. Great. They haven't really released much in the way of what the divers have found. And, well, either because it's preliminary information. And, by the way, these divers are way too good looking, uh, in my opinion, to be. <laughs> anyway, so they're going in the water checking out the hull both sides of the hull and they are when they come across holes or points where the water can get in they are patching and apparently they've found i'm going to pause it right here apparently they found two holes on the left five holes on the starboard side oh ron used to be a commercial diver okay well then ron you probably know what this guy is going through and um you know how good looking they are so they're patching holes these divers are finding points where water can get in and that and that's good i don't believe there's been any announcement about how they're either going to write the ship or more importantly than after they write it raise it with that being said the comments that have been floating around 
social media are, you know, okay. It's, it's obviously a mixture of very positive comments. There are also on the other end of the spectrum, very critical and disparaging comments. You guys screwed up. You let a, a, uh, a treasure like this sink, but no constructive criticism. And then of course, there are the comments that I kind of put in the middle, which do involve criticism, constructive criticism might say, but criticism nonetheless. Now, um, I'm going to bring up some of these comments. Let me get this screen up for you guys. Now, I don't know if you can read these based on the size of, of the screen, but among the many comments I've received uh, from uh, some of the comments that I've received from a subscriber by the name of Old Tugs, I love that name, very critical of the Buffalo Naval Park. And so why would I have critical or differing opinions of what I believe? Well, this is what I find the most fascinating. And I'm never going to be one to shut off or delete comments just because they differ. I actually find them very interesting. So old tugs. And by the way, I know this guy's name. How do I know that? Because he sent me very interesting emails behind the scenes. I'm not going to share those with you because he sent them to me privately, but I will paraphrase. Anyway, so he's basically saying that the folks over at the Buffalo Naval Park, uh, people like Shane, and I'm going to, here you can see Shane and this tattooed guy to his right. I don't know what his name is, but anyway, Shane um, on the right-hand side here, curator of the Buffalo Naval Park. He is not head of maintenance. He is not the, if you want to call it the, the ship commander. Shane is the curator, the archivist. He is the one that catalogs all of their artifacts. I say that because, let me go back to the comments. Comments like this from old tug, old tugs, where he says, this is a catalog of incompetence. If these people think that the level of the ship relative to the dock is an indication of its draft, then the organization is in worse shape than the ship. The spokesman doesn't know the difference between boat or boot top and bootstrap. Before I respond to that, I want to show you this because this guy. <laughs> um, he, he writes incredible emails, um, and it's important to me to not just label him a, a nut. Can you see this? Check out the information that he sends me behind the scenes and they're very well written emails. I, I don't believe in many cases they're well informed emails, but they're well written. He comes from a a lot of experience uh, in the field, so he has the right to offer differing opinions. In my opinion, he has the right to be critical. Um, this is a, an emailed response that I sent him, and so. I find this kind of stuff fascinating. When I wake up, it's like, oh God, here we go again. But if we don't get differing opinions about what these, you know, what's happening behind the scenes here, then what's the point? Everyone agree? All you guys agree with me? I, I think that's the stupid thing ever. So I don't know if old Tugs is on here this morning, but his emails are interesting and his points, while very critical of the Buffalo Naval Park, you know, I think they're points that a lot of people behind the scenes may be sharing, you know, the same frustrations. How could the Buffalo Naval Park let this ship sink? Well, obviously they didn't want it to ship uh, to sink. How could the Buffalo Naval Park leave watertight doors open? Well, as these guys pointed out on their Wednesday night, why isn't this coming up? 
Uh, bear with me a second. Okay, because I want to pull this up instead. As they said on their Wednesday night broadcast, when it comes to the watertight doors, why weren't the watertight doors closed? If the watertight doors were closed, why weren't all of them closed? You know, there's all kinds of conjecture going on. Here we go. This is the one that I want to share with you guys. So again, that's Shane on the right-hand side. And when these questions are raised by subscribers like Old Tugs, and you watch a live stream like what uh, Shane on the right and Steven on the left you know, are doing, you learn a lot, not only what's happening behind the scenes with these guys, but also the people that are tuning in to this live broadcast. And towards the end of this broadcast, as it turns out with mu museum ships, and I never knew this, but with museum ships, and it makes sense, passageways need to be cut through bulkheads to allow wheelchair access. Less aggressive ladders, you know, stairways even need to be installed for people that can't, you know, that don't have the mobility of a 20 something year old sailor. So the integrity of the ship has changed. And I can be frustrated when I hear, well, we didn't get all the watertight doors closed or the fire department ushered us off the ship. We couldn't get hatches closed. But at the same time, closing all those watertight doors, as we came to learn Wednesday night, doesn't necessarily mean that all compartments are sealed because of these tourist access hatches that are added to these ships. The Battleship New Jersey, the Slater, um, or in this case, the USS The Sullivans, the Little Rock tied up right next to it. Um, this is another interesting point. Um, the ships no longer have crews standing watch. We're, I, I'm actually going to get to that in a little bit. Um, yeah, Michael, Michael makes a point. I'm willing to cut them all the slack they need. I'm willing to cut them slack too, but for a different reason. I, you know, the... <laughs> I don't want to get hung up on this too much, but when somebody like uh, Robert, old tugs are critical of these guys in the emails that I traded with him, I tried to make the point that these guys are the ones that have put their chips into the game. These guys are the ones that are, uh, if not volunteering their time, you know, because they're on the payroll, they're the ones that, they, let's face it, historians don't get paid much. It's This is a passion for them. And so if we aren't going to step up and say, hey, you know, I'll take over. Not that I'm an expert, but I'm, I'll just, you know, hypothetically, if we aren't going to be the ones to step up and say, yeah, I'll take over. These are the guys that are playing the game and we need to support them in this game. Shane is a curator. He is not a ship's engineer, but yet he's got the passion to take on this challenge. He's not the one that is on the ship right now, you know, running hoses, operating pumps. He, but he is the one that's providing diagrams to the salvage teams, you know, these are diagrams that, you know, needed to be kept in good condition in the event something like this happened. And guess what? It did. So I'm rambling. I, I didn't want to sit on this and, you know, focus on the subject too much because you guys are bright enough to, you know, do your own research, look at the latest broadcast from the lo local news stations, that type of thing. I will say, uh, let's see, Ron says, uh, yep, and they don't have a staff of several hundred people to be able to do that in a second's notice either. Good point, Rob. And uh, I was actually going to make this point. The pandemic <laughs> that we're all tired of has decimated 
a lot of the staffs that operate these museums and these preservation societies, or they've just flat out had to close. So when it comes to the USS The Sullivans, which is one of only four Fletcher class destroyers left in the world that are viewable, it's amazing in my mind that they've been able to keep this operation going. If you've watched their live broadcasts in the past, you'll know that I think they lost like 80% of their operating budget because of the pandemic. They're operating on 18% of what they would normally have in their coffers. Shane and Steven here, uh, I think they were, they were even furloughed for a period of time before they were brought back. They are the ones that are playing the game. They are the ones that have the skin in the game. So we can be critical and we can question what they're doing in the case of uh, old tugs, you know, subscriber old tug, as well as others. You know, there have been other comments on the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. I'm just picking on Robert here, old tugs, because his emails, like I said, are very articulate. But I think in some cases they're misguided, uh, not well informed or maybe maybe not getting the whole picture. And in my opinion, the whole picture is this. These guys have their skin in the game and we need to support them. I have no doubt they're going to get the ship floating again. Uh, one last comment about the Sullivans. Tell me what you think. I believe this could be one of the best things that could have happened to this ship because it brings uh, national notice to their, op their operation. Scrutiny, definitely, but national notice to their operation. And the other thing, too, is that it's opening it up to um, some federal funding that might be made available. Again, they're a limited staff. These guys don't have endless hours to pursue grants, that type of thing. They're operating on just a fraction of what they would normally get revenue-wise because of the pandemic. So this could be a very good thing that happens for the Buffalo Naval Park. I know it's kind of a perverse statement to think, what, their ship's sinking? Putting some of their archive... Um, their artifacts at risk. Yeah, that's the downside, but they're going to get this thing floating again. It's going to be open to the public again. I have every bit of confidence. This is the team that's operating this uh, museum and, and we need to support them. So enough about the, <laughs> enough about the USS, the Sullivan's Keep an eye out. I believe they're going to be doing another live broadcast this coming Wednesday eight o'clock Eastern, seven o'clock Central. If you haven't subscribed to the Buffalo Naval Park, I've said it a million times. If you're not tired of me saying it already, uh, subscribe, click subscribe. There are, there are over 4,000 subscribers right now. Before all this happened, I believe they were at 1,800. So there's a tremendous show of support for what these guys are going through. And that's great, but it shouldn't stop there. Um, if you can donate, great. If you can't, at least subscribe like their videos, help them get additional traction so that they can get the advertising dollars from YouTube. Um, moving on. I wanted to talk about the keybird. And so I'm going to bring this up. And let's see here. As I said at the opening of this live, and <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear the lightning and the thunderstorm outside, but it is phenomenal. Um, am I even still live? Yeah, I am. Okay. Oh, there's nine of you. Hey, that's great. Okay. So for those of you that aren't familiar, briefly, the B-29 bomber keybird crashed or uh, did, did a ditch in Northern Greenland in 1946, just after World War II. They were on a mission, ran low on fuel, and they had to ditch in Northern Greenland. This team went up. Uh, oh, hey, Joshua. I see uh, we got someone else making a comment here. Um, this team went up to try and salvage the keybird. Now, if 
you want to watch the documentary. There's a Nova documentary that was done about this in the mid 1990s. That's how I first found out about the keyboard. Check it out because, and you can find it on YouTube. It's everywhere. So I'm not going to get into the whole story except to say that when they got all of the engines installed, they got the propellers replaced, they get the plane running and, uh, here, let me back up. So they get the plane running and they start taxiing. Um, that's that Doolin, the flight engineer from the commemorative air force. So they get the plane running, they get it taxiing and all four engines doing great. Fast forward. Um, a lot of bouncing around, you know, that type of thing. And then the unthinkable happens. So I'm going to let this play out. This Go back, check out the Nova documentary so that you're aware of what happened to the keybird. The damn thing catches on fire. And the fire gets out of control. And it ends up burning to the ground. Now... For those of you that are fascinated with this story, and I've been fascinated with it for decades, they say that the auxiliary power unit at the back of the plane, the small four-cylinder engine that's used to get the plane started, to get the main engine started, uh, that caught on fire. Gasoline splashed all over the place. We're going to get into this in other episodes. I think I went too long about the Sullivans because I'm running out of time. But the plane burned on the burned to the ground because the auxiliary power unit uh, caught on fire and they couldn't put the fire out. So Josh says, Josh here says, I think there's a way to save the keybird. I'm going to pull up his comment. Um, either borrow a container ship or aircraft carrier and put a crane to go get it. Well, unfortunately, Josh, um, as you can see here, the plane. Um, has burned to the ground and this was in the 1990s um you can see here it's it's in pieces but the story doesn't end there it's in pieces it's sitting up there in northern greenland there's four huge radial engines four props but what I decided to do, and this wasn't really by choice, it kind of fell into my lap. I've actually done research on the keyboard over, over the years. You know, you Google things if you want to call that research. But I also read this book. Let me get a full screen up here. I also read this book by a guy by the name of Carl Hoffman. Carl Hoffman was a writer. I believe he was contracted by the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. He was also up there. So he wrote this book called Hunting Warbirds. Came out, I want to say in the early 2000s. I could be wrong about that. Anyway, I've read it like five or six times. And it's fascinating because it lets you know a lot of the stuff that occurred behind the scenes that couldn't be included in a 55 minute Nova documentary. Now in this day and age of social media, I always tell people, I actually had this conversation last night with somebody. If you want to become an expert on a subject online on social media, all you have to do is read one book. That's all you got to do read a book because no one likes to read anymore. And I read this book by Carl Hoffman and I thought I knew everything. Well, it turns out I don't know shit. Um, yeah, Josh says, just bring it back here to the States, bringing those pieces back here to the States. That's something I've always wondered about why, you know, they should and they, and, and, and maybe they, they can, um, you know, I'll just show Josh's comment here. Um, it would be great to get those remaining pieces back here. <laughs> this plane is out in the middle of nowhere. It would be a very big challenge. It would cost a lot of money, but maybe that's something that could be done in the future. Anyway, 
going back to my comment about reading a book, you may like the show Deadliest Catch. There's books about that. You may be, you may like uh, rock bands, you know, like Guns N' Roses or books about that. Read a book and all of a sudden you're an expert. I read this book. And like I said a few moments ago, I thought I knew everything until, and Ron and Janice um, saw some of these videos that I posted last summer. I got a comment from a guy by the name of Bob Vanderveen, basically saying, eh, your videos are kind of close, but you know, you, you got some of it wrong too. And what he was talking about was some of the videos that I had done about the auxiliary power unit in the back of the plane. If you want to check those out, they're on, you know, the, my YouTube channel, history X, check them out. Turn, come to find out Bob Vanderveen, the one that left that comment, he was the one in the back of the plane. Um, and I was stunned. So yeah, I'd been Googling things about the keyboard over the years. Uh, Tanner S. He's been fascinated with the story ever since he read uh, read about it. Did you read the book? Um, if you read the book, that's cool. Um, oh, and thanks for the comment. Also, see you bringing more light on the subject. Talk about more light. This is what I'm. This is what I'm getting at. Bob Vanderveen actually gave me his phone number. And as I said, he was the one that was in the back of the plane when it was on fire. Talked to me for hours. He was very generous with his time. And he said, well, then you should talk to some of the other guys on the keyboard. Um, so then it snowballed. I actually uh, got in touch with Carl Hoffman contacted his author site. Um, he's written a, a lot of other books that are really, really good, like Savage Harvest. Check this out. But anyway, I don't want to get off track. Talk to Carl Hoffman, uh, Zoom call for about 90 minutes. He was fascinating. Carl then gave me Vernon Rich's uh, email address. Talk to Vernon Rich. Then it snowballed to Matt Jackson. Matt Jackson talked to me for hours. Matt Jackson was also on hand. Matter of fact, um, this is Matt Jackson right here. Um, he is the one in the middle with the goggles talking to, so talk to Matt Jackson for hours. Anyway, what I'm getting at is I have accumulated almost 30 hours of interviews that these guys have you know, either shared their memories, uh, shared their criticisms in some cases, but in most cases shared their support and have kind of dispelled a lot of the myths that not only appeared in the Nova documentary, but also even appeared in Carl Hoffman's book. Because again, just like the Nova documentary, there's only so much you can put in a book too. So what I'm going to be sharing with history x viewers in the coming weeks and i'm sorry because i'm looking at the clock and i can't believe this time has flown by already but what i'm going to be sharing with history x viewers in the coming weeks and you can see bear with me a second here um actually i'm going to stop sharing this in the coming weeks, I'm going to be putting a lot of these. <laughs> yeah, Michael Phillips, I smell documentary. Well, I'm going to be putting a lot of these interviews in video form. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get rights to the video that was in the Nova documentary, although I am talking to WGBH in Boston. They're the owners of the video. So I might be able to get rights to it. But if I can't, there's plenty of photographs that can be used to help tell the story. Um, what are we talking about? Matt Jackson in this, let me pull this up here. I'm just going to play this for you real quick. For those of you that, not, that are not aware, I'm going to share this with you. And, oh, thanks, Josh. <laughs> um, Josh just subscribed to the channel. Hey, it's always good to have a, uh, always great to have a new subscriber. I appreciate it. So 
um, keep an eye on uh, what's coming next. And I'm going to play this for you guys real quick. This is only 90 seconds long, and it'll give you an idea. As you know, the keybird burns to the ground. Everyone thinks it's because of that auxiliary power unit, but there is definitely more to the story. And this is what I'm getting at. But I will tell you this. The environment that we had is inconceivable. You cannot explain it to somebody that watches the Nova video. You have no concept of the elements we were dealing with up there. It is the most desolate, awful place on the planet to be working on something that's been sitting there for 50 years the time we went. But I tell you, there's a lot more to the story. And the perception that it was a series of screw-ups bad decisions the only person that was privy to the decision was Daryl when he pulled that airplane out on the frozen lake he wasn't supposed to go any further than the edge of the lake okay so I just posted that yesterday and it's already got over almost 2,200 views just since uh, yesterday afternoon. So not even 24 hours. It kind of tells me that there are a lot of people out there like me, fanatics like me that are interested in the keyboard. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people also that may not be familiar with the story. Yeah, they know that some B-29 bomber may have uh, ditched up in Greenland. Oh, that's all they know. But you know, when you talk about what people now, okay, now I'm getting really excited. When you talk about what people like Matt Jackson shared with me and, and, and what I was able to encapsulate in um, just that short 90 second trailer, there is a lot more to the story than just, oh, the APU caught on fire and the thing burned to the ground. Uh, okay, um, I was going to stop at a half hour, but I can't. <laughs> Bob Vanderveen in the back of the plane, and I'm sorry, if you guys don't know who these people are, um, you, you, you might tune out, but Bob Vanderveen in the back of the plane caught a lot of flack because the APU was left on. A lot of people feel um, he should have been able to shut it off so that it didn't catch on fire. But as you can see, according to what Matt Jackson had to say, and I'm going to get into this uh, in the coming weeks. So stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed, definitely subscribe to History X. But there is a lot more to the story. Uh, the plane wasn't supposed to go out on the lake like it did. Um, it was supposed to stop and stop short of of the lake. It wasn't supposed it wasn't supposed to take off. And how do we know that? Um I'm going to show you this real quick. Oh, I hope. I, okay. How do we know that? How do we know the plane wasn't supposed to take off? Because when it was taxiing, do you see the ladder, the uh, uh, ingress ladder, the cockpit ladder hanging down? It wasn't supposed to take off that day. It wasn't supposed to fly. It was only supposed to taxi. It was only supposed to be a test run. But yet everyone thinks that the plane was supposed to... Um, take off that day and it just wasn't but in the nova documentary they you know they make it appear that it was so there's a lot more to the story um <laughs> i thought this was funny um you know i was only supposed to stay on um i appreciate ron and janice saying keep going we'll stay on uh that's nice of you guys but i am going to cut this off i only wanted it to be a half hour for those of you that did tune in and it looked like uh, what I think there was maybe 15 of you at one point. Fantastic. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to be on here next Saturday. Keep an eye out in the meantime for videos to come. Not only um, about the keybird, but uh, I also did a, a video um, or an interview with a World War II veteran about an LST 
uh, transport ship during World War II, which is fascinating. So there's going to be a lot more things to come. Support the guys over at the Buffalo Naval Park with the USS, the Sullivans. They need all the support they can get. Thank you for hearing me rant about um, how they're the only guys in the game. We need to support them. So throw your support pack. But with that being said, if you have comments, critical comments, don't hold them back. Keep the comments coming because they're probably thoughts that a lot of other that a lot of us have have had, and they're questions that a lot of us would like to have answered. So, thank you for tuning in. I went over my half hour. Thanks, guys. My name is Ken Stano. Thank you for checking out History X, and I hope you guys have a great Saturday.